Hello, uh, my name is Brian BZ Douglas. I'm an independent journalist based outside of Cleveland, Ohio. I called this press conference today in order to bring attention to the allegations of prosecutorial misconduct against Senior Assistant Attorney General Dan Casares. I started looking into this story nearly a year ago, and it is quite frankly too big for me to cover alone. And many times I have summarized this investigation as a rabbit hole that branches off into more rabbit holes that lead to underground ponds you can go fishing in. When I first discovered these allegations in January, my first question was, why hasn't anyone covered this? And over the last year, there were two essential questions that I had to answer before I was moved to publish. The first was, is Tony Viola truly the man before me, the one that so many people were willing to come forward and defend? And the second is, was it possible that a prosecutor could get away with such brazen acts of misconduct? Now, over time, the answer to both of these questions for me became an emphatic yes. Over the last two months, I have begun to release stories from this investigation. First was Kelly Patrick, uh, ex-wife of Casares' brother, John Patrick, who has credible evidence to back up her allegations that Casares intervened as Cuyahoga County prosecutor to prevent his brother from being charged with domestic abuse and drug charges for a basement grow operation. A week and a half ago, I released a 3,000-word article containing nearly a dozen hours worth of interviews, which details the sordid tale of the prosecution of Tony Viola. Casares and U.S. Attorney Mark Bennett, his federal counterpart in a mortgage fraud task force, engaged in multiple instances of prosecutorial misconduct to convict Viola in federal court, but have faced no consequences. Casares and Bennett wired up their office manager, Dawn Pacella, and sent her to spy on Viola before the trial. Pacella also witnessed the suppression of evidence and a sexual relationship between Casares and Catherine Clover, a key witness in multiple cases prosecuted by the task force. Dawn Pacella eventually provided all of this information to Viola and personally assisted him with his legal defense at a state trial where he faced all the same charges as the federal, and with her help, Viola was acquitted on all counts. Pacella was scheduled to testify at Viola, on Viola's behalf, but never appeared in court. Dawn was found dead in her apartment of an alleged alcohol overdose. The convenience of her death, coupled with the many suspicious details surrounding that day, leave myself, Viola, and Dawn's parents very disturbed that her death has never been fully investigated. Today, I have invited Kelly Patrick, Dawn Vio uh, T uh, Tony Viola, and Dawn's parents, Edward and Karen Pacella, who are making themselves available to the press for the first time via live stream, to share additional aspects of their stories that still need attention from the press. And any additional, and, and uh, it, we would like to call to the attention as well, any government agencies that are supposed to address prosecutorial abuse. It was only a few weeks ago that the Pacellas finally decided to meet me, providing the last pieces of the story that I felt were necessary to tell it fully. I was only able to convince them to come forward because I genuinely care about this and was moved and angered by the story of their daughter's death. I believe Dawn Pacella should be celebrated as someone who tried to do the right thing, and that she would best be honored by exposing the corruption she planned to testify to. So we are joined today by several individuals and organizations who can speak to additional abuse by Casares, or the fact that this type of abuse is not an anomaly. Keith Wilson uh, from the People's Archive of Police Violence is joining us in solidarity. Uh, it is their website that ultimately led to this reporting. Uh, Mariah Crenshaw of Chasing Justice will be joining us later to speak to the current landscape of prosecutorial behavior in Cuyahoga County. Uh, Sarah Olson, a longtime advocate for wrongfully convicted prisoners. Brenda Bickerstaff, a leading organizer for Issue 24 and a private investigator who Casares once threatened for in, uh, with indictment for simply doing her job. Asia Jones uh, and BLM Cleveland had planned to attend in order to also express solidarity. They have had trouble getting here tonight. And we will also be joined by Robert Grunstein, a Vermont attorney with Cleveland Roots. 
He's the author of Bad Minds, High Places, which describes the systemic failures of Cleveland's legal system and the FBI raids on Cuyahoga County. And lastly, Elsa, Elsbeth Baumgardner, a former entrepreneur, pharmacist, and attorney who served five years of an eight-year sentence that ultimately goes back to her trying to expose corruption by Casares and others in the legal community. Now, before we hear from them, I'd like to take one quick moment to introduce myself to any professional peers in the press. I took up this path in the summer of George Floyd, covering Black Lives, the, the Black Lives Matter movement here locally. I set out to learn this trade by doing it, the same way I carved out a successful career in web design and development before. Over the last 16 months, I have been a student of the city, looking to its activists and most oppressed citizens as my teachers. I've learned about police abuse and prosecutorial misconduct from those on the front lines, like Brenda Bickerstaff, BLM Cleveland, New Era Cleveland, the Cuyahoga County Jail Commission, Tamir's Campaign for Justice, and legal activists such as Chasing Justice. Several journalists have offered me advice, mentorship, and peer review the, in, along the way, and in this regard, I'd like to especially thank Eric Sandy for his encouragement in helping me get my first story published in Cleveland scene, as well as offering editorial assistance on this latest article. And lastly, I must extend some public gratitude to Tim Tolka, uh, and the author of Blue Mafia, which tells the story of Richard Olavito and how the nation's first consent decrees in Warren and Steubenville came to be. Anyone who talks to me about criminal justice in Ohio for more than 10 minutes will eventually get a pitch from me to buy this book. Tolka and I talk regularly, and he helped me with this investigation and my career as a whole, and, and I just want to make sure he gets a proper shout out. So with that all said, I would like to bring up Tony Viola, who has a statement and would like to share more facts of the case that he thinks uh, should be dug into. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for, for breaking the story and for your investigative work and interviewing folks to confirm uh, what we've been saying. I'm very grateful. I'm grateful for everyone who's come to my apartment uh, to join us. So thanks to everyone. Uh, and thanks to Kelly Patrick for coming forward and sharing her story. And of course, most importantly, thanks to Karen and Ed Pacella. I know this is very difficult for them to be on this call, and I'm very grateful to them for their support and being available to answer any questions or provide any additional information. You know, Dawn Pacella was my brilliant and kind-hearted friend who I admired and looked up to and all of my friends adored. And, um, you know, unlike other law enforcement officials in this multi-jurisdictional task force, Dawn refused to participate in or enable government misconduct. And she was very concerned that uh, evidence in cases was being withheld, and she also felt that the evidence I used to be exonerated at the second trial was not just specific to my case, but relevant to many of these task force cases of hundreds of other cases. And um, I believe she's right, because the evidence that I used at my second trial was not specific to me. It undermined the government's theory of the case, and it proved that there was no mortgage fraud. Make no mistake about it, though, the wrongful conviction in my case is not some mistake or a temporary lapse in judgment by prosecutors. This is a criminal conspiracy run out of the U.S. Attorney's Office to use false and fabricated evidence to imprison innocent American citizens. Prosecutor Mark Bennett and his colleague Dan Caceres knew during the federal trial that government witness Catherine Clover was committing perjury and they refused to allow her to go back on the witness stand, and they further refused to withdraw false testimony. In fact, they continued to use her false testimony in a dozen other cases. Now, while this story is now getting some attention, I've been fighting this case since 2008. I proved my innocence at a trial and still was locked in a jail cell for a decade because no federal judge would give me an evidentiary hearing so I could present the same proof of my innocence that I used at my second trial in federal court. But we were undeterred, and we've investigated Dan Casares and Mark Bennett for a decade. These prosecutors feel invincible, that they can do whatever they want. They're incredibly reckless, because the things they put in writing, in emails, proves the misconduct that we're alleging. Nothing is more powerful than the emails of these characters and talking about using and covering up the use of perjured testimony at trial and other fabricated evidence. Now, 
Let's be clear what our goals and objectives are. Sure, I'd like to clear my name. I'd like to move on with my life. I've had quite enough of this myself, I can assure you. But I also want to honor, uh, honor Dawn's memory. I think she's right. I think the evidence that was suppressed before my first trial, but she provided before the second trial, exonerates all or almost all of these mortgage fraud defendants. These are a thousand criminal cases that should be re-examined and reopened, particularly where Catherine Clover testified. And thirdly, today, right now, Dan Caceres is the senior assistant Ohio attorney general. This is one of the most powerful law enforcement officials in the state of Ohio. And yet we have 600 pages of emails between him and Catherine Clover that prove not only did he use perjured testimony, not only did he allow Catherine Clover to destroy evidence that she found inconvenient inside the prosecutor's office, he gave undisclosed financial benefits to government witnesses and informants. He used Clover's perjured testimony. He had a sexual relationship with her. This is no fact witness in court. This is a fraud on the court to imprison innocent people. And Dan Caceres ordered Dawn Pacella to wear a wire. She was 23 and 24 years old when he decided that it would be a good idea to have her wearing a wire to invade our defense trial uh, strategy sessions and learn about our defense at trial, which is completely illegal. We have massive evidence of criminal activities by Mr. Caceres. And we call on Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost without further delay to suspend Mr. Caceres right now and conduct a full and complete investigation into misconduct that goes back decades, not just in my case, but in a myriad of other cases. And we have the proof, which we are happy to share with any state agency who would look into this, any criminal defendant uh, who wants to have their case reexamined, or any investigative journalist that would like to delve deeper into the wrongdoing that we've articulated. And as comprehensive as Brian's investigative report was, I must tell you that we don't have enough time here to actually review all of the instances of misconduct in my case. But let me just highlight four quick points that merit further investigation. One is the Cuyahoga County prosecutor and this task force have collected $20 million of restitution in mortgage fraud cases and never sent one penny to the banks that are supposedly victims. What are they doing with the money? Well, we have the ledger. They're buying laptop computers for prosecutors, paying for hotel rooms. It's a slush fund for, for prosecutors, okay? Not restitution for, for victims. This is a money laundering scheme with restitution. Secondly, according to the FBI, they did not know about 10,000 documents in my case until last year. The FBI is saying in court filings, not only did they lie about evidence, but they were unaware of their own records in their own record system for a decade. This should be reviewed. Judge Donald Nugent has sealed records concerning Catherine Clover and Dawn Pacella so that others and, and, and myself cannot utilize this information to obtain post-conviction relief. And Judge Nugent has never explained why he sealed these records in the, in the first place. And finally, Mr. Caceres has admitted using a private Yahoo email account with his official signature on it to conduct official business. We've got a thousand pages of these emails uh, and he's carrying on a series of romantic relationships funded by the taxpayers with women who he's communicating with on the Yahoo account. And he's got a back channel means of communication with criminal defense lawyers through this Yahoo account. There's a lot here. You don't have to take our word for it. We've got documents in support of all of it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions after this press conference or at any time going forward. We greatly appreciate everyone for, for listening in and thank you for being a part of it. Talk to you soon. Uh, thank you, Tony. Next up, uh, I'll bring Kelly Patrick, who can speak to additional facts of her case that could be looked into. First of all, I want to thank Brian Douglas for this opportunity. Um, my name is Kelly Patrick. I was married to Reminger partner John Patrick, Dan Caceres' brother, for 10 years, and we have two children together. In 2009, I was assaulted by John. I called 911 and was taken to the hospital. The police found John's marijuana grow operation when responding to my call. I was at the hospital and the North Homestead police told me that I was safe and that John was in jail, but that wasn't the case. And surprisingly, no charges were ever filed. And a few months later, the kids and I moved out. I maintained a relationship with John and Dan and his family for the next 10 years. 
until 2019 when John took me back to court for full custody. It was in that litigation that John started to talk about the 2009 incident, and I was asked a lot of questions about Dan. I started to suspect that Dan might have used his authority as a prosecutor and his connection with law enforcement to help John in that 2009 incident. After the litigation ended in 2019, I started to wonder if Dan was involved in other cases, and one night I just randomly Googled Dan's name and I found Tony's website, freetonyviola.com. I kept up with the blog because I believe Tony, and in June of 2020, I found out that he had been released, and I immediately sent him a message, and a few hours later, we met in person. Three weeks later, I had a meeting with a guardian ad litem, which is a lawyer representing my children, in another litigation that John brought on in 2020. During that meeting, that lawyer admitted to me that John admitted to him that Dan did intervene in that 2009 incident to protect John and to get him out of trouble. That was a turning point in my life because up until that point, I had believed that North Olmsted had handled the case properly and that John and Dan were honest lawyers. I had no idea and I couldn't believe that Dan was so reckless to help John out of trouble that day. For the past year, I've been collecting evidence through public records request and I have found that there was misconduct in my case. And since I've come public with my story, the only thing that they know what to do is threaten and intimidate me. And yes, this is uncomfortable and this is outside of my comfort zone, but I feel like this is the right thing to do to speak up. They want to turn it around on me and make it look like I did something wrong or there's something wrong with me, but that's not the case. I'm happy to share my story. I'm very passionate about this and I will answer any questions that you have. Thank you. All right. Apologies for uh, any stream quality issues. We are recording it separately here so that it will be published later uh, in better quality. There's some signal issues we're still dealing with because of the mysterious power surge that we're all going to try and not be conspiratorial about. Um, so uh, with that said, um, I wanted to uh, invite the Pacellas, uh, if they wanted to speak or say anything to uh, any press watching, we uh, have had difficulty people uh, press showing up to ask questions live, but they will be, I have multiple of them that will be watching later. So I'm gonna bring them on now. I guess we're looking for the truth. There's been suspicious things around on staff. There's never been a full investigation. And um, I don't know if- Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Oh, okay. It's, we can't see you. Um, I don't know if there was any type of foul play, but we we need to find the truth. And it was important enough to Dawn to um, to fight for, and she was intimidated and uh, threatened, and it was important enough for her to stand up for the truth and we feel that the least we can do to honor her memory is to find out what really happened and to prevent hopefully try to prevent uh Dan Caceres from doing this to other people. Uh, I want to thank you, Ed and Karen. Uh Ed, if you don't have anything to add, I was gonna bring up the next person I wanted to speak. Just that during the time that Don worked at the magic at the task force unit, <clears throat> I mean she's I don't know just she she actually showed me pictures of the way they stored the files, and she explained to me how it was unprotected. They were stacked in the hallway, and she used to tell me too of how people would would go in there and take files then she'd never see them back put back and there's a couple other there's some some stories that she told me that i just i didn't believe that it was what was going on anybody had access to those files they were they were just in boxes anybody could get to them Anybody could take things out, 
destroy them. And there are some things about Casares that uh, I'd rather not say over the over the air what you tell me about him. Now, for um, any press who watched this later, I'm just going to mute you for a second. Any press who watched this later, um, would you be open to speaking with them who want to dig into this further? Possibly. It depends who it is. No, I don't want to. Talk, I don't want to talk to twenty different people. Well, I'll uh, if any any press want to reach out to me and uh, me, I'll help vet them for you or something. But uh, I'd like to bring up our next speaker now. I want to thank the thank you for joining us, uh, Don and uh, or, uh, Ed and Karen. And um, if you want to stick around, you can come back on later if you have any questions. Uh, so next, uh, we're going to be bringing up Brenda Bickerstaff, and she can speak to her experiences. My name is Brenda Bickerstaff. I'm a private investigator. Um, my encounter with Dan Casares, I was working on a case. It was a high-profile case, a doctor named Bruce Feldman. He was accused of writing scripts, and people were getting addicted to it. I went to go talk to a witness, which is my job, uh, to go talk to a witness in the case, and Dan Casares threatened to have me indicted. And this is what they do at the prosecutor's office when they do not want you to find out the truth. And it's just not just Dan, it's Kristen Carcutt, it's um, uh, Brent Curvell, it's, it's a lot of them that is involved in behavior like this. But the problem is, just like we have oversight that we want with this issue 24, we need oversight with that prosecutor's office because it's a continuous problem. There's people getting convicted wrongly all the time. They have 65% of the people that are getting convicted of crimes that they didn't commit. Then they have this so-called integrity unit. But where was their integrity when the case was going through the proceeding that's when you're supposed to have integrity you got integrity so oops they did 20 years now we got integrity are you for real okay give me a break here and I'm just so sorry that you went through what you went through. I really wish I was your private investigator back then. And you brought up this information about Mark Bennett. That is very, very interesting because his name has come up in a lot of mortgage frauds. So that's going to make me want to look into that. I'm very interested in that. And I'm sorry you had to go through what you're going through and everybody in this room that had to experience that. I'm really sorry for that. But we got to get a grip on this just like we're getting a grip on the Cleveland police. We have to have oversight to stop them from doing what they think they can do because of their position. Thank you. Can I add one thing? I just... First of all, th thank you, Brenda, for coming by. I just want to emphasize, and thank you for all you do. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to emphasize, and this is what Dawn wanted, and we want to honor her wish, but we want to share the information that we have with you. Mark Bennett is a criminal. I mean, this man has hidden evidence and played games with evidence, and win at all costs litigation, and you don't have to take my word for it. We have it proven and by his own writings. So we want to share this information with others, other investigators, other criminal defendants, and we, we have to come together. I can't drive criminal justice reform on my own, right. but combined, I think we can. We get people who've had quite enough of this and say, this is not right. We are not allowing the government to treat people like this anymore. But let me say this, we gotta stop the lawyers that wanna go along to get them. Well, that, the defense so lawyers are a big lawyers. part of the problem. Yes. And by the way, <laughs> I had a big fancy one who did nothing, Jay Milano, and I won a second trial myself from jail without a lawyer. So I agree with you. A lot of these lawyers get along and go along, but we have to come together and share our investigative information and resources because the goal is to reopen these task force cases. The evidence that I used at my second trial that Dan Caceres and Mark Bennett both put in writing doesn't exist. It was in their office the whole time. Exonerated me. It exonerates others. We need to come together and share this information. It is never too late to do the right thing. And it is never too late to have accountability for what Dan 
a Casares and Mark Bennett did Dawn. It's all about accountability. Right. That's that's a word that right. they run from. They right. don't want to be accountable. Right. Yeah. So yeah, we. I think we're all we're all in agreement. Like uh, issue twenty four is a good first step, and now we need to talk about issue twenty five, right. something similar, civilian oversight of police uh, or of prosecutor of prosecutors. So um, next, I, I'm uh, really excited to bring up someone who uh, has uh, done some incredible research into uh, issues with police training in Ohio, and has laid that right at the doorstep of of Attorney General Yost which this is also landing in his doorstep because, as you know, I said at the top, this is a senior assistant attorney general. He is all over the state now as a special prosecutor. So I'm going to bring on now Mariah Crenshaw. And make sure she... Hi, everyone. Hey, Mariah. Hi, Mariah. Hi, Mariah. Why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us what you've come to say. Come to say. Okay. So if you, if you look at the picture behind me, that is my dad. Stanley Tolliver. You know who he is, Brenda. And my dad I did fought. Work for him too. <laughs> my dad fought the Cairo County Prosecutor's Office for decades. Um, the judge, not the judge, I'm sorry, the prosecutor um, at that time, his name is Corrigan too, one of those famous names. Um, my dad was constantly in the media about the prosecutorial misconduct that was going on in Cuyahoga County. And I really think, you know, I'm going to kind of be talking to Black Lives Matter about this, but we need to have a movement to remove that Corrigan prosecutor statue that's down there um, in the little park that's, in, that's right next to the courthouse and right across the street from the Justice Center. They've honored a man who created um, that culture within the Kyle County Prosecutor's Office that is still being carried on today um, by Michael O'Malley. I think what's so disturbing to me is something that Tony said. I think it's very disturbing that you have people who are um, engaging in misconduct in the prosecutor's office to convict innocent people. Like our society will always have criminals. You don't have to create criminals. Um, this is an evil that must be addressed. And so Chasing Justice has been, uh, we reached out to state legislators and we reached out to the congressmen. Um, along with other states, there are there's a movement to hold prosecutors accountable to remove their qualified immunity. So what we're seeking, Chasing Justice, is we're meeting with these legislators and proposing legislation one of the areas of legislation that we're proposing is that prosecutors who withhold exculpatory evidence are um, criminally uh, negligent and that they should be charged as such. We're also asking for legislation that um, prosecutors who are manufacturing evidence um, and also, again, holding um, and allowing persons to and continue to engage in law enforcement who don't have their training. We know that they know all of this and they never share it with criminal defense attorneys and they never share it with anyone outside of law enforcement. And so there are a lot of issues that we're gonna be addressing through uh, pushing for new legislation. We want to open up the grand jury process to allow criminal defense attorneys to present their evidence to um, give another side of what's going on and that it's not solely allowed for prosecutors to present to grand juries. Um, in my opinion, this is a due process issue. How can they go in and be the only ones to present to a grand jury when there should be another, um, there should be another voice in that room for the accused? Uh, there's no representation. So if you stop and think about it, let's say officer friendly arrests someone and they put that person down there in the inhumane conditions of the county jail and so while they're in the county jail they're coming up with um the um decision to you know charge them what to charge them with and they're going to go into a grand jury well that person the the moment that that person is arrested and jailed they should be assigned a process a, a criminal defense attorney and when the prosecutor goes in 
to present to a grand jury to get an indictment, a criminal defense attorney should be present. Why? Because this is a due process issue, something that is guaranteed under the Constitution of the United States. And so we have to ask ourselves, where does due process begin? It begins at the moment a citizen engages with a peace officer. What we found is that in Ohio, a statewide culture of unconstitutional policing has occurred under the Ohio Peace Officer Training Commission and Academy. They are not tracking the training of critical areas of mandated training, which allows a lot of these guys to um, have legal authority to engage in law enforcement. Well, since they haven't taken the training, they don't have the authority. And since there's no tracking, this just become a big mess in the state of Ohio. So we're asking our legislators to really look at what's happened to people like Tony, what's happened to people like Tamir Rice, and what's happened to people like um, Sean Williams and Vincent Belmonte, where you have persons unlawfully engaging in law enforcement who are murdering citizens, but also those persons who are testifying in court cases who have no legal authority to be there. Um, in one case right now in the criminal, um, in the criminal justice system, um, we have someone who has um, admitted on the stand he never took the training. This person has been deemed um, untruthful and unreliable by uh, Judge Solomon Oliver, and he is not supposed to be used in any court proceedings. We need legislation that says when a peace officer has been deemed untruthful, that he is decertified. There are so many things we need to be doing. And so what Chasing Justice is doing is we're reaching out to all of these legislators. We're telling them the issues. We want these loopholes closed. We want people like Tony Viola, who has been you know, adversely affected by prosecutorial misconduct, to have a law in place to protect him and other citizens who are now going to become victims and subject to those prosecutors. This is evil. If you ever want the definition of evil, say Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office. It is the definition of evil. These people are using every tactic under the sun to violate the rights, the constitutional rights of citizens. And they are doing everything they can to go up the ladder of success and become judges. This must cease. So we have to be able to um, address this legislatively. We know what the needs are. And so my team is diligently working on proposed legislation. Next week, we'll be meeting with many legislators and we will be giving that legislation to them. And we will be pushing, pushing, pushing for um, legislation to protect and to, to remove those persons like Daniel Casares and Mr. Bennett and Mr. O'Malley from public office. They are doing a lot um, we, they're doing a lot of, um, uh, you know, malfeasance and, and the, the, the state has a wrongful conviction fund. We need to address the root of the wrongful conviction fund. And so we need to know, um, you know, why is it that in Cuyahoga County, we have the most wrongful convictions in the state of Ohio, historically? Even now, why is that happening here? It's happening because we have a culture in the prosecutor's office of doing exactly what's been done to, um, um, to, to Tony. And so, Tony, I want you to stay strong. I want the families to stay strong. You have a voice. Continue to use that voice. Make sure that you know who you are and, and the evidence that you have. Um, the, you are not alone. It's happening across the country. People are tired of what's happening. Thank you, Brian. And, 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 you know, I hope and pray that, you know, we get to talk again soon. And Tony, I hope I get to meet you face to face and not on a, on a, um, you know, a live stream. Thank you so much. Oh, we, oh, well, we you to, oh. Okay. Talk thank to you. <laughs> thank you for, jo I don't know. I'm, I'm uh, rusty at tech. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but thank you for, for joining us and what you had to say is powerful. And thanks for all you do. We're, yeah, Tony was lots of thank you. Sorry, I, we were muted on our end. Oh, okay. So just wanted to thank you not only for your kind words for me, which I appreciate and your, your words of wisdom, but just for all you do, because I know you're really 
in the fight every day. And I'm grateful to you. And I think a lot of people are because I know you're doing a lot of good stuff. So I salute your efforts and support all you do. And, and thank you for your support. And yes, we'll meet in person sometime soon. Um, and now, next, I'd like to bring on uh, an, an author. Uh, thank you, Mariah. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next, I'd like to bring up author Bob Grunstein. Uh, he's someone I encountered when uh, I was working on Viola's case, and uh, he reached out to me to tell me about the book he'd work on and his experience in Cuyahoga County. So, Bob, do you want to go ahead and share your statement? Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. First of all, I'd like to extend my condolences to the Pasadas. It's a withering loss, and I hate to contemplate. I hate to contemplate it. My parents always felt that the worst thing in life would be to have your children predecease you. So I'm awfully sorry, and I acknowledge their loss. I'm very sorry. I hate thinking about it. Secondly, Mariah makes some very good points about the grand jury. The grand jury, you could indict anything. You could indict, you could indict a cadaver. And I've seen transcripts of the grand jury. I was lucky enough to get some of the Tamir Rice a grand jury proceedings sent to me illegally. And the prosecutor could, um, the, the prosecutorial behavior is contemptible. And Mariah is absolutely right. It's time for Ohio to adopt a rule in which you know people who have been targeted by the grand jury to have a defense uh, attorney present. Hawaii has that, but it's a huge minority of the states in the United States which have the right to have representation in a grand jury and even knowledge of being indicted. <clears throat> it's basically a Soviet-style secret proceeding in which the complaining witness, uh, the prosecutor's office, will behave contemptibly to get what he wants. Uh, I'd also like to, you know, address something Mariah said about um, needing legislation to control prosecutors. There is a case, it's a, it's a very seminal case called Kalina v. Fletcher. It's a Washington state case, which says there is no prosecutorial immunity if the prosecutor uh, brings false evidence to uh, in pursuit of a grand jury conviction. The problem is the law doesn't matter in Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. It doesn't matter. You can have all the rules, that is to say legislation, procedural rules, precedent, and even Supreme Court uh, rulings. And if you have the decisive influence as a prosecutor and you control, you're, you're part of a, you know, the secret group who controls elections and who runs, you can do anything you want because you're only accountable to yourself. It's a problem of character. It's a character problem, not only, as well as an institutional problem of the people who, you know, there's no third party who controls these people except the feds. And for the feds to come in and break things up is enormously expensive. The, uh, you know, uh, assignment of, of, of assets and resources to do this thing is very expensive and it takes years. The Cleveland um, FBI rates were preceded by nine years of FBI investigation. Very expensive. So Mariah is right uh, to, you know, to, to notice some of, the, some of the defects of the grand jury proceeding. And I think the uh, grand jury, you know, someone who's subject to a grand jury investigation should have a defense attorney. But the problem is you can have the best rules in the world and people who aren't accountable to anybody except themselves will uh, disregard them. I mean, Tony asked, how can this thing happen? Well, it happens because the illegal system is an interest group. It's people making careers and income on the basis of elected positions and maintenance and income values are much greater and much, more, much higher than moral and ethical values. People are sworn to uphold the law but they're primarily, once you're an owned person, once you make a career and you're dependent on the income uh, of, public, uh, you know, uh, of a public position, you will lie about anybody to maintain your position. If you notice the recent event in um, Armin Budish's uh, office where uh, the prosecutor, O'Malley, was chased off by Mill Mason 
who said, if you don't stop investigating Armin Budish, you're going to find yourself running against a competitor in the next primary. If you watch, ever watch, you know, uh, this, the city on the hill, it's, it's about uh, Baltimore. I, I'm sorry, Providence, Rhode Island, so an, an Irish Catholic family and a man who's working his way up. And what, what, what you see is there's a bunch of people we don't see, we don't know, who make political decisions about who can run, who will not run, and how will the election be determined, and who will have appointment powers. And that is what is terrifying in Cuyahoga County and anywhere where the judges are elected. It's a, you can control these people because once you're in a career, you don't want to lose it in mid in mid career by doing the right thing for some silly moral notion or some ethical notion, even though they're sworn to uphold the constitution. It's a God damned lie. You get to become an own person in the public sector and the people in charge of the truth will lie. My own story, I don't mean to be long winded. I hope I'm not um, talking too long, but my father was a professor of law and public policy at Case Western Reserve. I had Cleveland roots. And what happened uh, is I had to go back to Ohio in the first case I ever litigated there to prevent my mother from whom a fine arts auctioneer, auctioneer was stealing from her. She was an 87 year old widow, widow, newly created widow who missed my father desperately, very vulnerable. And the, uh, she sold some collectibles and the auctioneer embezzled $30,000 from her. So it's the first case I ever uh, filed there. And um, that's how I got to know Cleveland. What happened ultimately to a series of rather unrelated events was I wrote an editorial about a corrupt judge in Bedford, Ohio. Bedford, Ohio, the jurisdiction is withering. I mean, had Peter Junction, Junkin, the person about whom I wrote an editorial for incompetence. It had Tommy Longo, who used to be the law director and prosecutor, who was arrested in Mexico on an international warrant for, viol for dealing drugs with Little Italy, for date rape. He was giving his girlfriends drugs uh, and then raping them. And uh, weapons violations. He was picked up in Mexico. Then you have you know, Harold Jacobs, who was a judge there who was removed and indicted on prostitution charges. Then another law director, uh, Ken Schumann, who was indicted and, pro and uh, who was indicted and uh, actually found guilty along with Harold Jacobs on issues of um, bribery and uh, prostitution. So at Bedford, you know, you, you cannot hold a position there unless you understand the code. And the code is one of lie for income. Now, what happened to me is after I wrote an editorial about Judge Junkin and passed it out on the steps of his courthouse, I was extradited from Vermont. Tony says, how can these things happen? Why doesn't anyone do anything? Because they put you in jail. There were false felony charges brought against me. I got a no bill from the grand jury. They indicted me anyway, and it's illegal under the case of Freilich versus Board of um, Mental Health. It's a ground for malicious prosecution. And you say, well, Okay, just go to court, go to trial, have your preliminary hearing, and you'll win. Well, what happens is they don't give you a preliminary hearing. They won't bring it to trial. They won't rule on your motions. That happened to me. I had to go in for 11 trips from Vermont for pretrials. Every time they said, do you want to take a plea? I said, no, I'm not taking a plea. That's a 1,500-mile round trip. Then I came in for three trials, which were canceled. They refused to rule in on any of my motions to dismiss, and they refused to give me a preliminary hearing so where I could provide my you know, alibi evidence. I wasn't even in Ohio, and I did nothing wrong. That's how these things work. In Ohio, innocent means misdemeanor. This is also confirmed by a very good journalist, Sarah Koenig, who wrote this, this uh, thing called Serial. And episode six is on Cleveland. Sarah Koenig was a good NPR journalist who just skewered Cleveland. The, it, it just, it's just an indictment on Cleveland and elected judiciaries in general. Uh, and close, so I, I appreciate the time. I've probably been talking too much. But uh, if you read my book, you'll see the systemic practices of Cuyahoga County and how they crush you if you exercise your First Amendment rights and how they refuse to give you procedures, which Mariah says, you know, let's have new laws, let's have new rules. 
the new rules and laws don't matter because they won't follow them. They won't abide by them and there's no one to hold them accountable. And to answer Tony's questions, why does mo don't more people come forward? Because they're terrified and it's the end of your life if you do. Finally, I think if, if you read my book, Bad Minds, High Places, you see the relationship and the coordination and the consensus between all the people, the judges from the lowest court of uh, first resort in the municipal courts through the uh, uh, courts of common pleas, the appellate court and the Supreme Court and the federal court. The federal courts, uh, the judges in the federal courts made their careers in the state courts and they will protect the local courts. They will make sure none of their friends are exposed. They will bar you from litigating. They will declare you vexatious. They will impose filing, filing restrictions and they'll put you in jail. And finally, in closing, I think one of the most hilarious things is in my law school class was Frank Celebrezzi. He's on the eighth district court of appeals. His family, the cell, I mean, the federal courthouse building is named after Celebrezzi. He was in my law school class. He's the only person in Cleveland state history who was caught cheating on his law school first year project. We had a large writing project and in very small sections, there were like 12 people in, in our writing section. So it was impossible to cheat. Frank went to one of our classmates a very decent person named Frank Barnes, who's you know in New York, and said if you, could, you know, asked if you could see Barnes' uh, writing project just for formatting purposes. So Barnes is a very decent guy. I said, yeah, take a look at it. So anyway, the teacher, uh, Klein, got two papers which were identical except for the signature. Frank Celebrezzi, our noble eighth district appellate judge, copied it verbatim. I, I, I xeroxed it, and nothing happened to him. So in Cleveland, stupid and dishonest is better. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks for the strong closing, Bob. Um, and uh, rounding us out here tonight is uh, one more person who um, stepped forward uh, and I learned about through the Casares uh, investigation. And she has her own pretty wild tale that I, I have yet to get into fully. Uh, I'd like to bring up Else Baumgardner. Hope I pronounced that correctly. But if not, Feel free to correct me when you step on up. Thank you, BZ. Um, I really don't have much prepared. This kind of I just kind of came along to offer support to Tony and the other people that I've. Uh, but my story goes back uh, 20 years. Um, I was a very successful uh, biotech patent attorney. Uh, Lived in Oak Harbor, Ohio, but I had a DNA lab here in, in Cleveland. Uh, did technology transfer work with some of the scientists out of uh, Case Western. But on uh, in my personal life, I undertook um, some advocacy for, uh, I guess, the marginalized and under, you know, the rural poor. Uh, I live in a small town, Oak Harbor, Ohio, where we have the um, Bessie, Davis Bessie nuclear power plant. And so our school district was blessed with abundant money. Um, my husband was elected to that school board, served on it 12 years, and during the time frame we were there, we discovered a uh, contract fraud scheme, kind of a variation on ghost employees, people that are familiar with. Um, and what, I, what we found is that you literally have almost a form of organized crime operating within our government. Um, and uh, when we we would set forth the evidence of this. We'd go to our county prosecutor, who, by the way, it's a county of 40,000 people, it was Mark Mulligan at the time. He is my husband's uh, cousin. Uh, my husband was his roommate, college roommate, uh, and I think even was in his wedding. And we would bring this evidence of, you know, and it was mischaracterized as me be, uh, making up stuff because I was unhappy with how our children were being treated, and it had nothing to do with it. They started targeting our children because the money I found that was missing or misappropriated or fraudulently spent was $1.4 million. Um, and that's just what I found out without looking very hard, and that was over a period of five years. And what I found was the school lawyers were facilitating this in conjunction with the administrators and the union uh, uh, 
reps, uh, the teachers union reps, because they were the beneficiaries. They were getting paid sometimes to be two, three places at the same time, overlapping contracts, whatever. I go to the prosecutor's office, and he assigns a uh, 19-year-old kid to review what was an extensive, pretty extensive forensic uh, accounting uh, it, and said, oh, there's nothing here. And then uh, I was characterized as making stuff up and they started pursuing uh, bar complaints against me that I was making all this stuff up and of course uh, nothing could be further from the truth. But anyway, uh, my advocacy brought other people forward to me about their um, own problems. Uh, and I s undertook some kind of advocacy for women who were that had been sexually abused um, or abused in other ways, children that had been abused. And uh, I started finding out that the Erie County prosecutor, Kevin Baxter, uh, was allegedly involved in uh, protecting drug trafficking, sex trafficking. An African-American woman approached me, claimed that she was kept in sexual servitude by this man. I was like, whoa. Um, I found that he was involved in federal grant fraud. He had a uh, co company, that uh, Island Express Boat Lines, that was in negotiations to get a dockage contract in Port Clinton, Ohio. And then finally, um, a Christian counselor referred a woman to me uh, who claimed that, uh, that there was some evidence that her mother had, while her death was a rule to suicide, uh, there was compelling evidence that it was, in fact, a homicide and that she was killed in retaliation for getting ready to blow the whistle on a multi-county drug and sex trafficking ring involving some prosecutors, lawyers, judges, police officers. Um, I don't make those kind of allegations lightly. I reviewed the autopsy report, I reviewed, and it was pretty clear that there is enough reason there to at least take a look at this and reopen it. I filed a motion for the appointment of a special prosecutor in December 2001 in Erie County Common Pleas Court, extensively documented with affidavits. And Mr. Baxter um, basically turned around, and then I went to the Port Clinton City Council meeting uh, on behalf of my clients and myself as a local person um, to advocate against the contract, not going into business with a company that was, in fact, under investigation by the Bureau of Criminal Investigation in the state of Ohio uh, at the request of Sandusky city officials. So, you know, it's just amazing that uh, these kind of things, and instead of anybody investigating a thing, I found myself charged with falsification for standing up at a public meeting like Americans do all the time, in opposition to what was an illegal contract. Mr. Baxter was then able to, um, he had me charged in Ottawa County Municipal Court. Uh, his friend, Mark Mulligan, my husband's cousin, uh, allowed that charge to be brought forward with no probable cause, uh, and then proceeded to bring in a special prosecutor by the name of Timothy Braun, who has since been disbarred uh, for sexual misconduct, and a uh, judge, visiting judge from Circleville, Ohio, 150 miles away. Um, now, you can see all the potential for abuse of resources with that, and that's what led me to understand how you rig cases in the state of Ohio. And so the larger problem is, uh, yes, Cuyahoga County is, is by far and away the worst, but we have a problem in Ohio with excessive home rule that does not allow the state to adequately police prosecutors, judges. You cannot, there is no place to go to bring public corruption charges against a public official. And instead they will retaliate against you, create a charge. Long story short, I was convicted in a rigged jury trial. They stacked people on the trial. Um, and then I was not able, in the meantime, they began the disbarment proceedings against me. Um, and then they put me in jail without a warrant so that I could not prepare for my disbarment. Um, things spun out of control from there. Um, and I ultimately was disbarred. 
And I decided this is the early stages. Um, quite frankly, if social media existed in the early 2000s, this probably never would have happened to me. But I developed a website by the name of Airy Voices because I still had ongoing civil litigation related to all the other things I had found. And I found that um, Chief Justice Moyer at the time had developed a uh, case rigging plan through these retired visiting judges. And he assigned a man by the name of Richard Marcus, um, who was retired judge out of Cuyahoga County. Um, and he was assigned to all my civil cases and we caught him solidly uh, rigging my civil cases uh, against me to award judgments uh, against uh, my, the people I was complaining about who were stealing the money. Um, he's one of the few judges who actually heard from my client, Krista Harris, the African-American woman who alleged that she had been sexu kept in sexual servitude, who was also prosecuted and put away, by the way. Um, and I said to him, you know, you have a duty now to report this. Um, instead, uh, he ran to Dan Caceres in Cuyahoga County and had me indicted. And it ended up being, I was facing 101 years, I think, at one point, the number of counts. I was indicted for intimidation, for the filing of federal lawsuits exposing case rigging in the state of Ohio. They claimed that my filing of federal lawsuits intimidated this judge. Now, keep in mind, that's a First Amendment violation. You have a right to petition in this country. That's filing federal lawsuits. It's protected activity. And the federal courts never found that anything I filed was false. So who presides over whether a, a court, a, a bona fide civil rights case or racketeering case is false on its face. And, it, and Richard Marcus was not the only person sued. I sued a number of other people in this conspiracy, this racketeering conspiracy. Not one of them chose to have me uh, indicted. And what they really were upset about is I had developed a website called Airy Voices with a, a business partner by the name of Brian Dubois. And we were way ahead of our time. We were putting up the actual proof in real time of, uh, of how you rig a case. We would put in transcripts, we would show the public, this is how you're doing it, how they're doing it. And that's basically why I was indicted um, and ultimately convicted, as, as Mr. Uh, the prior speaker said. Bob uh, yeah, Bob Grinstein said, they will make it impossible. Um, I was held in the hole. Uh, I was not even secretly indicted, brought to the, in the hole after midnight. My husband didn't know where I was, held on a 360000 cash only bond issued by Richard McMonagall um, as a domestic terrorist. This is, keep in mind, this is right after 2001, 9-11, uh, so it, a year later. So they're abusing, or not, several years later, I should say. But that, people don't understand that the Patriot Act has put in place uh, many, many areas where if, you're, if you even criticize a judge, they can basically say you have become a domestic terrorist. And I believe that's what was abused in my case. My case was assigned to Shirley Strickland Saffold. Um, her reputation precedes her. Um, and long story short, I never, I, after two, three hundred thousand dollars of uh, payment out to de the defense bar, which is quite frankly, the defense bar of Cuyahoga County is, a sh is, a, is a, they should be ashamed of themselves. Um, you have these big names. Jay Milano was involved in my case. Uh, Ian Friedman, uh, Larry Zuckerman. These men take obscene amount of money from people, and they just basically plea deal you out, sell you down the river, work with the prosecutors. There is no defense bar in Cuyahoga County. It's it's a disgrace. Um, I ended up negotiating a, a plea deal finally because it was going to be impossible. Um, to get a fair trial in front of Shirley Strickland Saffold. And I negotiated an appeal bond um, because I was confident this case that the 8th District Court of Appeals would understand that the First Amendment protects the filing of federal lawsuits and the operating of websites, um, that, that criticizing a public official or a judge is not a threat under a, a Supreme Court ju jurisprudence going back you know, 60 years. Uh, I was wrong. My appeal bond 
Mr. Marcus or Judge Marcus was able to uh, place upon, think about that. This is the so-called victim in my case, telling Judge Saffold to place these restrictions on my speech, on my bond. That was not part of my negotiation, plea negotiation. I was not allowed to report criminal activity. I was not allowed to initiate any lawsuits um, against anybody anywhere in the world. So Shirley Stricken Saffold could rev revoke my bond, supposedly, for filing a federal lawsuit, even though she doesn't have jurisdiction in federal court. Um, I wasn't allowed to talk to people about the law. I was not allowed to educate people on their rights. Um, not surprisingly, I ended up having to file a federal lawsuit um, uh, against the pharmacy board, which had also taken my uh, pharmacy rights. And the filing of that federal lawsuit, they said, was a violation, and off I went to prison. Um, on an eight-year sentence uh, that I ultimately got out on, thanks to Judge Nancy Margaret Russo, uh, who was a wonderful judge who runs the reentry program. I can't praise her enough. Um, uh, my entire appellate process, as Mr. Grunstein has also said, was a laughable. Um, you can't get... Um, justice and I was viewed basically as the ultimate pariah because I was basically exposing the money grab that lawyers in this state um, have going. Um, they do rig cases, there's no question about it. Uh, they rig them through uh, assigning specific judges to specific cases and then the special prosecutors that operate all over the state, uh, Dan Caceres being one of the ones right now. Um, I don't know what else to say. Uh, other than uh, I, my case, I also pursued federal habeas corpus relief. Um, and that was a, a, an eye opener because as Mr. Grunstein said, um, your federal judiciary is, is, is basically comes out of the same, um, uh, and I, I don't wanna say that they're all, I, I know there's good people in the system because I know they've reached out to me and I was given um, at, you know, uh, assistance that I otherwise wouldn't have. Um, I was released in 2013. It's been eight years, and we're only now finally um, uh, going back and looking at. We're going to reopen this mess from the earliest case, the early first misdemeanor, uh, because I have luckily have all new people in Ottawa County, and uh, they're good people, and um, they believe me and they recognize a huge injustice was done. And so the hope is we reopen that first case and vacate it out, and it is a, a domino. Um, everything else falls from there. Um, I can't, you know, the notion in the last year, um, you know, I, the sex, the abuse of office that Mr. Caceres engages um, for sexual favors, that's, you know, that is Kevin Baxter's um, playbook. Um, yeah, and the Kevin Baxter taught was his. Was his mentor, yes, yeah, yeah. And, and Kevin ba Baxter is the one who brought him in as a special prosecutor on a case on me in Erie County. And then um, uh, Judge uh, Marcus, who was a retired visiting judge. And that's the other incredible thing. Not in, in my cases, and everybody understands this intuitively, um, there is supposed to be a law enforcement investigation in a case. No police agency investigated a single crime in my case. My cases were all brought by private citizens who somehow were able to file charges either directly with the court and municipal court, or on Judge Marcus's part, he was able to get access to the grand jury through Dan Caceres. There is no police investigation in my cases. So they took the words of Judge Marcus alone saying, these statements are false. End of story. So the, the main thing I'm here to say is this is the entree into the, um, Dan Caceres is an entree point into a much larger statewide problem. Um, and Dave Yost, um, you know, I'm, I'm publicly challenging you. Um, at the present time, he's engaged. Uh, we saw the Mike Marin, who was a, an attorney down in Southern Ohio. He recently passed away. He was running the sex and drug trafficking operation down in Southern Ohio for 40 years, according to some witnesses. I ran into some of the women who were victims of that while I was in Marysville. 
Um, and we only were able to indict him in the, I think in 2019. Um, Mike DeWine has been covering this stuff up for decades. Um, I was able to go to the United States Department of Justice in 2001 before ever charged with anything. Um, I got to give salute to Congresswoman Kaptur and Congress um, and Kucinich. They arranged for me to meet with the Inspector General of the United States of America, Glenn Fine's investigators in June 2001, uh, about this whole pay to play structure in Ohio and how you rig cases. Um, that case investigation or that task force that they were trying to put together was torpedoed once Senators Voinovich and DeWine got wind of it um, through some FBI agents. So, uh, you know, I can't begin to describe how corrupt this state is at a structural point. And, and in closing, there was a statement made by the chief um, or the supervising agent down in southern Ohio who brought in, who's in on the Larry Householder case. Um, and he was saying, I don't understand. He basically was in his interview, I don't understand how this got so far gone. That also involved Davis Bessie. So again, it's, you know, the Davis Bessie first energy money um, that started all my problems. Um, but he said, that he made a statement, how does a state, how did this get so far gone? And I, I made a comment in the Columbus Dispatch, you need to talk to me. It's a structural defect in this state. The AG's office, the auditor's office, the ethics office, the Supreme Court of Ohio and its disciplinary office, it is all politicized. It is all governed by pay to play. And you cannot, there is no recourse in this state against corrupt officials. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you to one, everybody. Can I add one thing? Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add, well, first of all, I appreciate you, Elizabeth, coming Thank you. over here and, and, and communicating with me when I was in jail and offering support. And I appreciate it, and your husband, too. So. Yeah. Thank you. But you know what you said, I just wanted to augment what you said. This is a, let's talk about this mortgage fraud task force. I was accused of stealing $46 million from, from JP Morgan and from Citibank. Did the, so at the second trial, and this was Dawn actually, Dawn's idea. So we asked them, did you guys ever call the police? No. Did you ever file a report? Better Business Bureau, did you ever file a lawsuit? I supposedly stole $46 million and no one ever said a word. Now, if you owe 500 bucks on your uh, J.P. Morgan Chase credit card, they're going to call you, or if you owe 80 bucks. So this idea of what Elsevier just said is really important about indictment without any investigation. Really, we're a bunch of realtors selling houses. As far as I can tell, there was no criminal activity by anybody until the investigation started. And that's when Dan Cassara started having sex with Catherine Clover and started hiding records and, and destroying evidence. And when Mark Bennett started shifting evidence between the task force building and the U.S. attorney and the FBI... And this is a very important point. My, I, I also want everyone to know I stole $46 million, supposedly, and my bond was zero. Sign here and come back. I, and I asked this lawyer, am I still allowed to run my business? Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. You're presumed innocent. So indictment apparently is no big deal. It's really an investigative tool to Arvin Klar and these BCI characters where we're just going to indict you, bully you into pleading guilty. There's no investigation whatsoever. Even interviewing these banks, they were not interviewed until one month before the trial. And that's actually when, when Dawn became alarmed because she said in some of these meetings and the bank basically said that they didn't prevent these loans that we were accused of tricking them into making. But this notion of indictment without investigation is prevalent. And we just, in our state particularly, we just go after whoever we want. And indictment is an intimidation tool or it's an investigative tool to just bully you into pleading guilty. And this mortgage fraud task force is collecting all these millions of dollars and it is essentially a slush fund of you know, to pay informants and unaccountable. No one knows where the money is. It's not going. So I just want to augment what you said, what you experienced, which I'm sorry for what you've gone through. Okay. And I, I'm, it's heartbreaking. But this is just another day at the office for these characters. They just do it over and over again. And I hope to God that they've done it to enough people that we can come together and say enough. And what they did to us, unfortunately, is done and we can't undo. But we have got to stop this from happening to anybody else because this is absolutely crazy what's going on in our in our country. And that, if I may add one yeah, thing, um, I would invite people. There is an interview of me on uh, SanduskyRegister.com from December of 2019, December 11, 2019. Um, and that related to Tim Braun, who was found um, guilty of sexual harassment in his office. And But there was so much more covered up there. But the... 
uh, Matt Westerholder of the Sandusky Register, who's a great guy and has helped me a lot and, and is trying to get, is, you know, willing to go in, in where a lot of uh, mainstream media will not go. Um, he made the, he, had, he said, why do you do this? And I'm like, just as Tony said, I don't want what happened to me to happen to another human being. And, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian bearing false witness against people to put them in prison I, you know, it's worse than death in many ways. It's a living death. So thank you. Thank you, Elspeth. Um, I think that's going to conclude today's press conference, and I want to echo exactly what Else said, is that this investigation, Tony Viola's story, Dan Casares, none of this is an end point. It is an entry point. There is a lot of systemic corruption going on in the prosecutor's office and additionally cultural corruption. Because when she says that Baxter and, and other prosecutors teach the guys coming in, this is how we handle cases, this is the way you do things, we have a culture that needs to be uprooted and looked at. And uh, I, I hope anyone who has been watching will reach out to anyone who has been here. You can reach out to me. Uh, I'm happy to share everything. I am not looking to keep this story to myself. As I said at the top, it's far too big for me to work alone. So I want to thank everyone for watching and good night. <laughs>